Well, this morning, uh, I've chosen to continue our exposition of the Gospel of Mark and not turn attention to the coronavirus, our COVID-19, like so many are doing today. In many churches, that's the theme, that's the topic. And I'm not saying that is right or wrong. I'm not saying that there's no justification at all to look at the virus in light of God's word. But I'm just saying that I'm not doing that today. The, the passage that we will be looking at today speaks to our current circumstances. It speaks to our situation. And so I've chosen to continue in the Gospel of Mark and Today we'll be looking at a passage that is very familiar, a passage that is well known, but it's an event that we need to look at and examine because it does speak to us where we are today. When we look around our world, when we look around our church, when we look around our city, people are alarmed, people are nervous, people are concerned. Some rightfully so, some others not justifiably so. But God's word has a message for you and has a message for me. And when we come to this passage, this is a passage that we need for today. This is a passage that we really need every day in our lives. Because this is a passage that speaks about the lordship of Jesus Christ. It speaks of the fact that Jesus Christ does not bow down to any circumstance, to any situation, to any virus, and you can add to the list. Jesus Christ is the Lord of creation. And Mark makes it clear in this passage that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the wind and the waves. He's the Lord of the storm and the sea. And he tells us some of the marvelous benefits that will be ours if we will put our trust and our confidence in Jesus Christ. So let's prayerfully and expectantly and attentively come to these last seven verses of Mark chapter 4. Uh, the subject of our text is Jesus stills the storm. Not still like a thief, but stills as in calming down the storm. And as we look at the passage, I realize you don't have an outline, but I'll give you the outline up front in case I lose you along the way. But it's a very simple outline. In verses 35 and 36, we have the introduction to the stilling of the storm. In verses 37 through 39, we have the miracle of stilling the storm. And then finally, in verses 40 and 41, we have the conclusion of the stilling of the storm. But we want to begin by looking at verses 35 and 36 as an introduction uh, to Jesus calming the storm. And this introduction comes by way of an exhortation. At the beginning of verse 35, Jesus exhorts his disciples, and he says to them, let's go over to the other side. Let's go over to the other side. He points his finger at the disciples, and he has fingers pointing at himself, and he says, I want us to go over to the other side. That other side, according to Mark chapter 5, verse 1, if we are allowed by God to see it next Sunday, that's where we'll be, is basically the country of the Gazarenes. That's where Jesus is heading. Jesus is leaving where he is, and he wants to go to this country, and the only way that he and the disciples can get there is if they cross the Sea of Galilee. And if they do that, by a boat. That's the only way that they can travel. They're not traveling by land. Instead, they're traveling by sea. 
And by traveling by sea, by means of a boat, it's going to take about six to eight miles to get there. Now, Mark doesn't tell us why Jesus wants to go there. Sometimes Jesus wants to get away from the crowds. Sometimes he wants to get away from the multitudes and just be by himself and be with his father. But Mark doesn't tell us that is the case. All we know is that Jesus seems to have a mission in mind, and that mission will be in Mark chapter 5 when he encounters another demon. What Mark does tell us is when the exhortation was given in the time that it was given. Mark tells us it was on that day. It was on a particular day. And that might not seem significant, but when you understand Mark chapter 4, you'll realize that is a very busy, busy day when Jesus gave this exhortation. The day actually begins in Mark chapter 4 verse 1, where Jesus is ministering to the multitude. And the multitude is there. It's such a large group that he decides to get in a boat and from there teach. And what he's teaching, he uses parables as his method of teaching. And remember that as Jesus sat in that boat, as he communicated with the multitude, he gave various parables. One was the parable of the soils in verses 1 through 20. The parable of the lamp, the parable of the measure. You know, he, he gave these different parables so that those who were in the masses would hear, but not really hear and understand. Because what our Lord did through the parable, he interpreted those parables and gave it to his disciples so that they could understand. So the Lord had a very, very busy day. The multitudes are there. His disciples are there. He's teaching. He's ministering. And in reality, that day really doesn't start with Mark chapter 4, verse 1. It goes back to chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus was accused of being out of his mind by his family. His family heard about the fact that he didn't even have time to eat as he ministered to people. They said, he's out of his mind. We got to go rescue him. And then a little bit later, his enemies make an accusation. They say the things that Jesus is doing, he's doing by the power of the devil. And Jesus has to show them how ridiculous, how foolish, how asinine that is to think that he cast out demons by the devil. So the Lord is busy in ministry. He's worn out. He's tired. And on that day, evening comes and he says to his disciples, he exhorts them, let's go over to the other side. The disciples responded in verse 36 by leaving the multitude and then they take Jesus along with them in the boat. So the, again, the means of traveling to that destination was by being in the boat. It's the same boat that Jesus was teaching in. And as Jesus is teaching, the evening has come, it's all over. Jesus says, let's go over to the other side. And the disciples dismiss the multitude, so to speak. They say goodbye, they leave them, and they take Jesus in the boat, and they start traveling to the other side. Now, in 1986, a boat was found that was probably used in the time of Jesus. And that boat was 26 and a half feet long, 7 and a half feet wide, and 4 and a half feet deep. You say, why the details? Because in that boat, not only was the Lord Jesus Christ, but also his disciples were in that boat. It could accommodate probably up to 15 people. And that's the kind of boat that our Lord was in with the disciples. There was a stern, and under that stern was a place where a person could rest and sleep. And so that's kind of the introduction. And Mark adds a detail that Matthew and Luke doesn't add, Mark points out 
that there were other boats with Jesus. In verses 37 through 39, we have the miracle of the stealing of the storm. Jesus calms the sea. And that's the heart of what this passage is all about. That Jesus does a miraculous deed. He does a miraculous work. And we're introduced to the seriousness of the storm in verse 37. Mark tells us that as Jesus and the disciples are traveling in that boat, making progress, that all of a sudden, according to verse 37, there arose a fierce gale of wind. Some of the other translations put it this way. There arose a great storm of wind. There arose a great windstorm. There arose a fierce windstorm. There arose a fierce storm. And the term that Mark actually uses when he says a great storm, he says it's a mega storm. It is a huge and a large storm. So here's Jesus and his disciples in the boat, and unexpectedly, out of nowhere, they encounter this mega storm. And that was common when someone would have a boat and travel on the Sea of Galilee. Because of where it was located, the hills around it, it was common for there to be strong winds and there would be storms. So Mark tells us about the seriousness of the storm. It was fierce it was great when Luke talks about it and Matthew talk about it. They use some of the same terminology, but Matthew actually calls it a seismic, where we, uh, the idea of an earthquake. It was such an impactful storm that it could be equated with an earthquake. So this wasn't just um, no waves kind of going up and down, a no little being, you know, getting a little bit seasick, this was a serious storm. So serious that in the last part of verse 37, Mark tells us what the results were. Mark says that the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat began to be filled up. So here are these men in the boat. They're now in the midst of a storm, a mega storm. And as they're in the midst of the mega storm, the result of that mega storm is that all of a sudden the waves begin to rise back and forth, up and down to such an extent that water started going into the boat. And the boat started filling up with water. Now it's fine when the boat is in the water. But you know you got a problem when the water starts to get in the boat. And so there's a problem here. And as we go on in our text in verse 38, we learn of the reactions of Jesus and his disciples to the storm. And again, this is a serious storm. This is a mega storm. This is a seismic storm. This is a whirlwind type storm. And Mark tells us in verse 38 how our Lord responds. What his reaction is. And amazingly, Mark tells us that Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now just think about this. This boat is rocking and rolling. This boat is being inundated with water. This is a storm 
a major proportions. And here's our Lord sleeping like a little baby in the boat, doesn't have a care in the world, not impacted or affected by anything that is going on. I mean, he's out of it. And you say, no, how is that possible? Well, you've been there before. You've been at a point in your own life where you've been so exhausted, so tired, so wiped out, that once you get to sleep, you are just knocked out and you're dead to the world. And what we see is a glimpse of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he took upon human flesh, is 100% God, but also 100% man. And as the God-man, he got hungry, he got tired, he got weary, and there were times where he just needed to get some sleep. And despite the raging waters, the wind impacting the waves so that the waves are coming up and putting water into the boat. Our Lord is asleep. He's in the stern and he's got his head on the cushion and he doesn't have a care in the world. That's his reaction to the storm. And it's quite different than reaction of the disciples. <laughs> Their reaction is the difference between night and day. And, and so we learn of that reaction in the last part of verse 38. It says that they awoke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Now, these are fishermen. I guarantee you they've been through things like this before, but never to this extent. Not all of them are fishermen, but got Peter and James and John and Andrew. They're fishermen. This is not the first time they've ever, ever been on a boat. They've been on a boat. They faced difficulties like this, but they've never, ever been in a storm like this. And so here, this crew, so to speak, crew of disciples, panic. They're alarmed. And the good thing is, they turn to Jesus. They turn to Jesus. That's something that we can learn in our own lives. That when times are difficult, when times are hard, don't turn to everyone else. Don't turn to the news. Turn to Jesus. It's amazing how we make so many plans, but we really don't pray. We, we talk about prayer, but we really don't pray. We do more talking than praying. And so here were the disciples. And, and we have to commend them for at least the fact that they're turning to Jesus even though turning to Jesus in this situation is not ideal in the way that they did it. But they tried to wake him up. That's how good of sleep that he was enjoying. So sometimes I always remember the joke that my, wasn't really a joke, it was a dirty joke that my brother played on me one time. I was in a sound sleep. And so uh, he wanted to get me up. It was time for me to get ready for school. And I was dead to the world. And I didn't want to get up. But he knew how to get me up. He got a little cup of water. And took that cup of water and began pouring it on my face. I got up. Now, I don't know how they got Jesus up. I don't think they did that. But, but what they're trying to do, they're trying to wake him up. And waking him up at the same time, all kind of words are coming out of their mouth. So it's interesting when you look at Matthew's account of this. 
in Luke's account of this and Mark's account, and you start putting it all together, here's what they're saying. They're saying all different types of things. Matthew says they're saying, save us, Lord. Save us. We are perishing. Luke says, master, master, we are perishing. And Mark's account puts it in the form of a question. They call him rabbi. They call him teacher. But then they ask the question, don't you care that we are perishing? What's common to all three accounts is the realization that the disciples understand they are in great danger, that they're facing death, and they are in the midst of perishing, And as they're in the midst of perishing, they cry out to Jesus for help. But Mark gives a little twist to it. Mark seems to suggest that the disciples were not completely on the up and up. That they were questioning the care of Jesus. Now, it could have been that they were saying, you do care, don't you, Jesus? But even in saying it that way, they're wondering, how can you be asleep? How can you allow us to go through this storm where we are in the midst of perishing and you have not done anything? You have not even gotten up from your sleep. But whatever their frame of mind was, they want Jesus to help. They understand that this situation is beyond them, that they can't do anything to solve the problem. They cannot cause the winds to stop howling and blowing. They cannot stop the waves from going up and down and into the boat and filling up the boat. And so they cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to verse 39, we see the actual miracle where Jesus calms the sea. They were successful in waking him up. And we see that in verse 39, that he was aroused, that he was awakened. And immediately he addresses the situation. He addresses the wind and the waves. And he rebukes the wind. He treats the wind like it is a person. And he gets into the face of the wind and rebukes the wind. Admonishes the wind. And then he speaks to the sea. I don't recommend you do that talking to inanimate objects might get you in trouble. But here is our Lord treating the wind and the waves as animate objects, as something that is alive. And he speaks to the waves. And remember, the waves are going back and forth. They're crashing against the boat. Water is coming into the boat. And things are out of control. The disciples are helpless. They don't know what to do. They don't know what Jesus can do. But they turn to him, and Jesus responds by saying to the sea, Hush. Hush. That is, be quiet. Be quiet. And he says also, not only hush, Be still. Be calm. And probably both of those commands were directed to the enemy, so to speak, at that time. The wind, hush. The sea, the waves, be still. Be gentle. So what happens? Jesus speaks, he commands. 
the wind and the waves, to hush and be still. He rebukes the wind. And you know what happens. Mark tells us exactly what happens. What would you expect to happen? If Jesus commands the wind to do something and commands the waves to do something, what do you expect will happen? That the waves and the wind are going to obey. They're going to do exactly what Jesus said to do. Quite contrary to us. But notice what he says. He says, hush, be still. And Mark tells us at the end of that verse, in verse 39, the wind died down. He rebuked the wind. He said, hush, and the wind died down. Not after a day or two, but immediately the wind died down. And not only that, he says it became, the sea became perfectly calm, the waves. Now there's really two miracles here. One miracle that causes the hush of the wind, that causes the wind to die down. That, that's one miracle. But just because the wind, wind dies down doesn't mean the waves Stop going up and down. Now, when the waves are rocking back and forth, you can take away the wind, but it takes a while for the waves to calm down. But not when Jesus says, be still, be calm. So the second miracle is that the waves immediately become calm or to put it in the words of our text, it became perfectly calm. And Mark uses that word mega again. You see, it started off, there was a mega storm, but now there's mega calm here. Jesus speaks, and the storm turns into being mega calm. The, the miracle makes it clear that Jesus is God. You have to be blind not to see that. No human being has the ability to speak to the waves and to the wind and to cause the wind to cease and to cause the waves to become calm. That takes God. And if you don't believe me on your own, you can look at some scriptures, Psalm 65, 7, and 89, 9, and Psalm 106, 28 through 29, where God speaks and causes the waves to calm down. And you remember in that great exodus, when they were crossing the Red Sea, God spoke. And then they were able to walk across the parted sea. Our text ends with the conclusion of the stealing of the storm in verses 40 and 41. And when we look at these two verses, we see the rebuke of the disciples in verse 40 and the reverence of the disciples in verse 41. 41. So after Jesus rebukes the wind, he now rebukes his disciples. The disciples didn't always get A's on their exams. There were times that they fell just like we fell. And our Lord is trying to grow his men, trying to develop his men, trying to mature his men. And so when they fail, it's his responsibility to challenge them and rebuke them and admonish them. And our Lord does this on this case with his disciples. Our Lord poses two questions to them to help them to see that 
something is missing in their relationship with him. The first question is, why are you so timid? Why are you afraid? Why are you cowards? Is what our Lord is asking. We don't get all the details, but as our Lord assessed the situation, as he saw how the disciples responded, even though they did a good thing in turning to Jesus, when you look at the other details, they acted as those who were scared, who were cowards. And Jesus says, I just want to know, why are you so timid? And then kind of digging in a little bit further, he asks another question. How is it? How is it that you have no faith? His real concern here is their faith. And when he talks about their faith, he's not talking about whether or not they're Christian or whether or not they put their faith in a saving way in Jesus Christ. They're disciples. They're believers. What he's concerned about is their day-to-day walk with God in which they are to trust God in all of their ways. And so he raises the question, how is it? That you have no faith. Matthew phrases it as Jesus saying that you have little faith. Luke said, where is your faith? And Jesus wants to rebuke them and admonish them in love and in kindness for the fact that they are lacking faith in him. That they're not trusting in him. That somehow, some way, they think that he does not care. That when he says we're going to the other side, that doesn't really mean we're going to the other side. That we're going to die in the water. So here they are. Jesus asking, how is it? How is it? that you have no faith. You've been with me a little while. You were with me, some of you, when I cast that unclean spirit out of the man in the synagogue in chapter 1. You were with me when I raised the paralytic from his bed. I first told him that his sins were forgiven. But in order that people might know that I can forgive sins, I said, pick up your bed and walk. You were there. You you, you were there and you heard about the fact that I cured a leopard. Nobody else wanted to touch him. But I came and touched him and it was my will for him to be healed. You were there and you heard about the fact that I healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. You were there when we were in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they didn't know who I was, but I told them, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And on that day, I healed that man with a withered hand in the face of all of the people. You were there when I cast out demons and healed the sick. You were there. So why is it? Why is it? that you do not have faith. You've read my Bible. You've read Hebrews 11. Why is it that we don't believe? Why is it that we don't trust in Jesus? So Jesus calls them on the carpet. He says, what I'm looking for out of you men, I'm looking for you to trust me. And I'm not saying take a blind leap in the dark. I've shown you the evidence. I've given you proof over and over and over again that I can be trusted. I've just showed you that I'm not just Lord of the Sabbath, but I'm Lord of creation. I'm Lord of the wind and the waves. I sat down with you, and I taught you kingdom parables. I gave you truth that I didn't give to the masses. I told you about who I am and about what God is going to do through the kingdom. 
How is it? How is it that you do not have faith? The story, in some sense, ends on a high note. But the high note is not really in relationship to the disciples, but instead in relationship to Jesus Christ. In verse 41, we have the reverence of the disciples. Now, the way that is worded in our text in verse 41 is that they became very much afraid. They became very much afraid. And here is Mark again using that word mega. He talked about the mega storm, the mega calm, and now he's talking about the mega fear. They got a huge fear. But this is not being afraid because they think they're going to perish. This fear that Mark speaks of here, this fear that is spoken of, is the fear when someone encounters God. When they encounter the presence of God or the power of God. These men come to their senses, to their realization Something extraordinary has happened here. Something that they don't fully understand and comprehend. And they don't don't say it outright that he's God. But they know that this is remarkable, what he has done. And it's caused them to have great fear. When Matthew and Luke talk about it, they throw in the word, they marveled. They were amazed at what Jesus had done. And here were these disciples starting to speak to one another because they've encountered something extraordinary. They've encountered God, even though they don't fully realize it. And so they say to one another, who then is this? Who then, in light of what we have seen him just do, in light of the fact that he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, hush, beast, who then is this? They understand that this has to be something that is far someone far greater and marvelous than they can ever imagine. They don't get it completely right, but they do know something is unique about Jesus. And so they're saying, who then is this? That the wind and the sea obey him. Who is this Jesus? That even the wind in the sea obey him. They do what he says. Let me end by just giving a couple points of application. I'll try not to keep you too long. But the first point of application is that this miracle is about the greatness of Jesus It's not about you and me making through the trials of life. It's about knowing who Jesus is. It's about knowing that Jesus is great, that Jesus is almighty. And that's what you and I need to recapture, that we have a great Lord Jesus Christ. That it doesn't matter what you go through, doesn't matter what you face, doesn't matter what the circumstances are, our Lord Jesus Christ is great. And Mark has been trying to prove to us over and over and over again that Jesus is God. That he's the Messiah, the Son of God. That he's the one who receives the Father's endorsement. He's the one who defeated Satan in the wilderness. He's the one where John the Baptist is not even worthy to untie his sandal. 
He's the one who forgives sins. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And now he's the Lord of creation as revealed in this miracle. My friends, you and I need to remember and rely upon the greatness of Jesus no matter what storms of life might come. Just like in the disciples' lives, there arose a fierce gale of wind, there will arise fierce gales of wind in our lives. And as a country, as a nation, we're in one. But who's greater? King Jesus or some virus? And we need to be, remember the greatness of Jesus Christ. We don't have to tremble. We don't have to bow down and be scared. King Jesus is in control. And we got to do more than just give lip service. The disciples, and that brings us to the second point. This miracle teaches us that we need faith not timidity, not cowardness when we encounter the storms of life. That's what we need. People ought to be able to look at Christians today and and see that we are people who trust Jesus. Does that mean we act foolish? No. But does that mean we act in fear? that we're cowards, that we're timid, that we got to be scared? No. King Jesus is on the throne. And we need to trust him and depend on him. And we got to do a better job than what the disciples did. They knew the word. They had seen all the evidence but they didn't follow through in their actions. And so, my friend, I'm going to ask you very plainly, what would Jesus say to you today in light of the the coronavirus, in light of COVID-19? Would he say, why are you so timid? Would he say, how is it that you have no faith? We need to be challenged to be people of faith. And I can't tell you what that looks like in each and every one of our situations. But faith is something that you demonstrate. Faith is something that is observable. As James says, faith manifests itself in works. And so we need to go before our God and ask our God, how do I, in times like this, demonstrate that I'm not timid, that I'm not a coward, but instead I have faith that Jesus Christ is great, that he's the Lord of creation, that he's the Lord of heaven and earth, that he's the Lord of the sea and the storm, and that he's the Lord of the wind and the waves. I leave you with that. Meditate on this passage. Get to know Jesus as revealed in these words, and ask God, God, how am I to respond in times like this so that people can see that I don't have a timid faith, but I have a strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we...